now coming to our discussion on Tennyson. You know that Lord Tennyson uh, became the poet laureate of England after William Wordsworth. And in his lifetime, Tennyson was considered to be the most significant poet of his era. Tennyson wrote many great poems and uh, uh, he was particularly noted for uh, his uh, elegy called In Memoriam, which he wrote in, uh, in memory of his friend Arthur Hallam. Then he wrote uh, poems called The Princess, published in 1847. He uh, wrote that famous poem called The Idols, uh, Idols of King, uh, which published in 1859. And uh, two, more, uh, two of his most famous poems are Maud and In Our Garden, 1864. Uh, Tennyson was regarded in his lifetime as to be a great poet who represented the Victorian uh, sentiments in a big way. But as time has progressed, Tennyson's reputation as a poet uh, has, uh, you know, uh, gone down a bit because Tennyson is considered uh, to be bearing the same sort of moral prickishness, same sort of moral hypocritic structure that, uh, you know, uh, Victorian age is uh, remarkable, uh, is, is remarkably emblematic of. And Tennyson is considered, uh, Tennyson's poetry is considered to be like uh, uh, the Victorian period itself, glossy on the superstructure and hollow underneath. And um, Tennyson's poetry has uh, sort of criticized in modern times a lot and Tennyson uh, has his reputation as a, uh, as a poet has gone down quite a bit. But, um, you know, as far as the poet of Victorian period, Tennyson is considered one of the representative poets of the Victorian period. Uh, his works reflect the tendencies and aspirations of the problems that, that agitated the, uh, the minds of men of his age. In other words, his poems reveal the great spheres of human thought, in religion, in morals, and in social life. All problems of his age sort of entered into the textures of his, uh, of his writing. To quote Stopper de Brook, for many more than 60 years he lived close to, to the present life of England as far as he was capable of comprehending and sympathizing with his movements and he innove what he felt concerning into his poetry. So Tennyson's uh, apprehension of his age was quite, uh, uh, you know, uh, is, uh, is quite contemporary. He, un he represented Sort of, he was a sort of representative of the elite class of the society, as you know that he became the uh, poet laureate in 1850. And his poetry had that figurative genius, meaning he had that lyrical flourish. He could write a brilliant, um, you know, about the most simplest of things in a very common, uh, in, in a very brilliant style. And he, he has that uh, that that eloquence, that mellifluousness that was remarkable of poet court poets before. The main features of the Victorian poetry uh, that we find in Tennyson's poems are, are, are you know, are a, are a spirit of looking forward, something impatient, sometimes, sometimes uh, anxious, sometimes calm, a period of looking forward, uh, a period of uh, moving forward with his age. Uh, his poetry kind of displays a sentiment that was aware of this national interest of the national tendencies. He considered the English culture to be something really superior and the superior culture needs to be expressed and needs to be obeyed and needs to be uh, you know, presented with a, sort of, uh, with a sense of order. This is also a feature, uh, meaning there are other uh, some characteristics of the 19th century poetry which are properly uh, noted in Tennyson. What that is uh, a sympathy with mankind as a whole that I have already said that uh, uh, is a, a sentiment, a, a sympathy for the common people of the world, especially with the humble classes, a love of country rather than of the town. Tennyson uh, is more a poet given to the idyllic uh, aspects of life. As I idyllic, I refer to idyllic as I D Y L L I C. So he's more given to uh, glorify or present the natural uh, the the country aspect of England more than the city life. Uh, so uh, this is uh, one of the features of uh, his poetry at the, at, the, at the same time. He displayed in his poetry a sort of social and hatred for social injustice and class tyranny. 
that all Victorians, uh, you know, in a general sense, exhibit that they were sort of given to so the, the spirit of social justice. But somewhere in the other, Tennyson's poetry shows a sort of class consciousness. It, his treatment of subject, his presentation of materials, his uh, his themes give us Mac of this sort of uh, this thing. Though outwardly he sort of uh, uh, displays a spirit of uh, social justice and a hatred forwards uh, uh, class tyranny. He was a lover of beauty. Tennyson was really a poet of uh, given to musicality of the words. Uh, regarding Tennyson, one uh, say, uh, James Joyce famously said, "Oh, he is not Lord Tennyson. He was Lawn Tennyson. On, on, he was Lawn Tennyson. Always coming with beautiful description, as if Lawn Tennis is going on." So, Tennyson's remark is remarkable for his love of beauty, and uh, as we we'll find in the Lady of Shalott, a reverence for the past. Tennyson was famous for uh, bringing the past with newer interpretations and in Tennyson the medieval past particularly finds an expression and Lady of Salat will talk about a story of the Arthurian legend about Sir Lancelot one of the lines of the Arthurian legend and he will talk about the medieval England but with a sort of nostalgic vision about it and he will present them in a modern uh, in a modern way uh, he had a sort of uh, expressed a sort of final appreciation uh, of the spirit of the old world history and the mythology of the Greeks and the Romans. Tenny, in Tennyson's poetry, you will see there is a wide range of subject matter that he has dealt with. A spirit of renewed and increased reverence for the poetic art and Tennyson is mostly remarkable for the great variety of meters that are handled with skills and a fine sense of music. This in every sense actually corresponds to the Victorian sense of poetry. Victorian sense of poetry as I said is given more to decorativeness, is give, given more to uh, a sense of order which sometimes supplants the uh, you know uh, the, the dialectics of uh, the, the dialectics of feeling whereas in romantic poetry feeling is prioritized to form in Tennyson's in, uh, in, in, in the poetry of uh, Victorian period as well as in Tennyson you see order social order discipline is given more a sort of importance with the same kind of uh, you know romantic uh, same uh, same kind of romantic vision of nature maybe there but they they were poetry is sort of more towards uh, you know giving order uh, to those disorderly emotions his poems preeminently reflect the victorian spirit in a sense that the deeper problems of human life moral religious and social finds an expression through his poems he has a distinct message to give to his contemporaries in the princess he undertook to grapple with one of the rising questions of the day, that of the higher education of women and their place in the first changing conditions of society. Victorian period is known for uh, you know legalizing education for all and it's a period when education is being prescribed for all because as I said uh, in the Victorian time the reign of the economy was in the hand of the ruling uh, was hand, in the hand of the middle class the class of the mill owner the class of the businessman who wanted to create the best for the people of the uh, you know uh, of, for their own generation and they had a sort of um, had this uh, moral obligation of projecting England as a country of order, as a country where social justice is being served to every sphere of life. So uh, that, 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 that you will find in his poetry. His Laxley Hall, which was published in 1842, is full of the rent, relentless spirit of young England and his faith in science. Victorian period, uh, you know, is often kind of... Um, often uh, plagued by a spirit of doubt. On the one hand, the approach of science is there. And science said that uh, the biblical vision of the world and the biblical interpretation of the world is no longer valid. And what we have to follow is the uh, Darwinian vision of the world where and there is no sort of comforting agency to protect you. There's no God to protect you, uh, as we'll find in the famous poem um, written by Matthew Arnold, over which the sea of faith is gone, Matthew Arnold says. 
Similarly, another group of poet was there like Browning who believed uh, in the theological, in the uh, theistic concept of the world that God is in his heaven and everything is right in the world, he said in his paper passes. Tennyson is a sort of poet who kind of balances between the both. One who is also uh, sort of um, projecting uh, the advance, advancement of science and at the same time he is also clinging to the old view of life and he is sort of trying to create a sort of balance by achieving uh, uh, through his poetry a sense of order which we have termed as this sense of Victorian compromise. He wanted to come uh, to reconcile the incompatibles like he wanted to kind of um, project England as a fast moving country developing in science and technology. On the other hand, England is a country which kind of adheres to tradition as the Oxford movement has said, uh, who adheres to, uh, who pays a lot of respect to tradition, who pays a lot of respect to, um, you know, uh, the old world ideas and like that and he wanted to create a sort of balance. In Laxley Hall, as I said, uh, which published in 1822, he is full of the spirit of the restless spirit of young England and his faith in science, commerce and the process of mankind. While his sequel, Laxley Hall, 60 years after 18, uh, published in 1866, he shows the revulsion of the failing which had occurred in many minds when the rapid development of science seemed to threaten that very foundation of religion. As I said, that he wanted to achieve this uh, sort of balance. Tennyson, um, you know, as I said, he uh, his poetic art uh, is uh, um, is I would say uh, if, uh, consists of this following element. He was a born artist. He had an extraordinary eye for beauty, even in his earliest poems. He lacked in originality maybe and depth as a poet, He had, but he had artistic mastery. He had tremendous control over words as I said. He could control words like none other, uh, uh, no one, no one of his contemporaries probably, uh, you know, Hopkins comes closer to him in this, but he has a tremendous sense of music. The felicity of the phrases, the beauty of the description, the charm of the power of sweet music, it, it engulfed uh, Tennyson. And uh, these are the, I believe, is, uh, are the dominant features of his poetic art is his simplicity. Tennyson could very simply describe a line but with utmost poetic beauty. His subject matter, as I've said, are secondary because he took subjects from old poets and writers and he uh, only he never took any revolutionary uh, subject like Byron did and he never challenged uh, uh, the way the English life was moving forward and the English life is being projected in literature. So there, but there was a simplicity of tone that you'll find in his poetry. There is a sort of clarity and lucidity. His clarity is of, uh, you know, mm, uh, in thought, in expression and in representation of the outside world. He represented world with a sense of logic, though he has that romantic ardor of beautifying everything. But he has also had the sense of logic that he could express uh, through his poetry. Uh, it is true that he did not attempt to express the more dreadful and involved passions of mankind. He was not ready to represent the vulnerable aspects of the human soul as Shakespeare did. He was more a sort of uh, in the middle of the things, he was sort of a goody goody. Uh, poet who is presenting only the good elements of the human civilization. Um, uh, tragedies, not the subtle, not not even he presented the subtle and distant analogies and the phrase, and the phases of human nature in which Browning had his pleasure. Browning used to represent these elements. Uh, he did not also attempt to write about that which he could not express with lucidity of thought and form. For him, lucidity of thought clarity of thought, simplicity of expression matters and whatever uh, and whichever subject fits this scheme, he took those subjects on. Um, mingled with the simplicity and clarishness, there was also uh, in Tennyson's poetry a certain uh, sense of sublimity. Tennyson was one of those poets who like Milton and Wordsworth considered themselves as consecrated spirits. He considered themselves as agents of God in a sense. The sense of their vocation, he believed that he is a man with a vocation as 
Milton often thinks that he is in this world with a particular duty to perform. Tennyson is also had the sense that uh, he is in this world to do something special. He had a sort of a vocation that makes uh, you know um, uh, to present everything probably with a kind of a poetical fervor. It imports a set of stateliness to their words given a sort of moral virtue. So he is not simply an entertainer he believed himself. It is he is there to uphold the moral virtue that Victorian England stands for, a moral order, a order probably that God has created and this order they have to uphold. In Shakespearean poetry also you will find the restoration of moral order but not by ob oblivion, not by uh, completely rejecting or, or rather being completely oblivious of the um, of the vulnerable elements of the human soul. But in Tennyson there is a strict sense of moral order which he has arrived at probably at the cost of at the cost of that those vulnerable human elements which you could give expression to. And I have already told about his Tennyson's uh, you know love of beauty his originality and his versatility, in his sense of superb music, his sense of unity, uh, unity and completeness. Tennyson like the uh, romantics also given to, uh, given to nature, but his nature is, as I said, more decorative, more uh, sort of a calming influence more a sort of a background than as a core presence uh, that the romantics had in their own poetry. Nature is a sort of a background. Here Tennyson is probably akin to Byron in a sense of the term that he is presenting nature more graphically here than, than, than spiritually in his poetry. Besides this, um, Tennyson obviously is a lyrical genius. He has a tremendous lyrical uh, talent. Um, he could express even the simplest of uh, things in a very beautiful way that is his greatness and um, but uh, what the moderns criticize him is uh, for his hypocrisies is for uh, the social wrongs that he has tried to hide um, inside the beautiful structure of his poetry his sense of narrow patriotism as i see he never exposed uh, the, the the tortures uh, you know uh, and the and the sufferings that the colonial england was inflicting on his colo colonies and the best the main reason of the English prosperity was because of that they, they were uh, kind of disturbing, they were kind of ostracizing the colony in a big way. So this aspect of the English society that they can be oppressors, they can be, they, they're killing, looting the colonies is completely absent in Tennyson's poetry and he is like a true poet laureate always singing in praise of England. Next, in my next upload, I am going to give you an introduction on the Lady of Salot and I will request uh, all of you to read about Tennyson and his art of poetry from Wikipedia and from the document that I have shared. So before the next upload, uh, before the next upload, please get your text ready. So I will be reading one part uh, uh, at a time. You know, there are four parts in this particular uh, poem that is the Lady of Charlotte. I will read one part at a time uh, and uh, will uh, ask for your commentaries on, uh, on the deliberations and taking those questions I will develop.